or Mike, do you want to review the Zoom procedures since we do have some new people on Zoom, looks like? Somebody started the recording. Oh. Yes. So uh, the Zoom uh, procedures should be uh, generally straightforward from what most people are aware of. Uh, if you have questions, please use the raise hand function. I don't have our official uh, list of, of instructions. Um, everybody I see here is seems like somebody who's done this in the past, but if you use your raise hand function or turn on your camera and wave your hand, we'll be able to go and uh, see you and we will, um, you should be able to unmute yourself. I have not set this up in such a way that everybody is uh, going to be tightly controlled because I don't see anyone here that is going to be um, necessarily a problem that we've had in some other meetings. So I think other than that, we should be good. Just use the raise hand function or turn your camera on and wave and we will put you on. Um, and if you've got something that is not on our agenda, the only um, major agenda item tonight is to take public input on the city plan. If you've got comments or questions on something not uh, about the city plan, uh, we will take those in general business. Okay. All right. Um, so the next item is approval of the agenda. Would anyone like to move approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Okay. Second. Second. Sean and Maria, second. Maria. And then all those in favor? Aye. Okay. okay. Um, comments from the chair? I do not have any comments. Um, I am apologize. I feel like I've been, yeah, a little overwhelmed the past two months, so I have not paid a lot of attention to planning commission business. Um, but hoping this meeting will help me get back on track. So I look forward to our public input session on public safety and community justice, natural resources and economic development. Great. Um, but first we have general business. Are, is, are there comments from the public about something not on the agenda? And Therese. I do, oh, okay, Therese. Okay. Go I, ahead, Trace. Go ahead. I thank you. Sorry, I can, I have a new Zoom interface and I cannot figure out how to raise my hand. I apologize. Um, thank you so much. Um, my name is Therese Mejo, and I really thank you for this opportunity to speak. I will keep within the limited amount of time, I hope. Uh, I'm the president of the Board of Trustees for the T.W. Wood Gallery, which is the oldest muse art museum in the state of, New York, uh, state of New York, state of Vermont. Our collection of 19th century American art was deeded to the citizens of Montpelier by master painter and native son Thomas Waterman Wood in 1895. We are an educational and cultural center for the visual arts in central Vermont. We provide high quality after school and summer ch child care through innovative arts pr educational programming. We offer arts education for adults, seniors, and marginalized populations. We conserve and display two historic American collections of art in our care. A second collection of art from the WPA era was given to us on permanent loan to the wood after World War II. And we exhibit art by contemporary Vermont artists and community arts organizations. I apologize that I have not been involved with city planning process before this time. I am just beginning to understand how the city creates a blueprint for its future and how organizations like T.W. Wood Gallery can be involved. I really want to thank you for having a section on arts and culture in the city plan. I realize at this point in time, it's too late for me to have much of an impact on that chapter. But since this evening is devoted to the economic development chapter, or at least part of it is devoted to that, I'd like to talk about the intersection of economic development with arts and culture. The city plan rightfully acknowledges the quality of life in our community depends on a number of factors, affordable housing and childcare, access to good employment and public transportation, workforce development, to name a few. Quality of life is in a community is also deeply dependent on access to art and culture. Art and arts and culture attract people to and keep people engaged in a community. Arts and cultural events are economic forces that help drive tourism, 
bring customers to local businesses and provide employment. TW Wood and its partners, the Monte Verde Music School and the Center for Arts and Learning together employ more than 10 people. If I could ask for any change in the city plan on arts and culture, it would be to raise the priority of the strategy of creating a Montpelier cultural plan from medium to high, and to be sure to include a wide swath of the arts and cultural community in the creation of that plan. My main criticism of the arts and culture plan, which I think in general is very good, is that it is too heavily focused on the visual arts and on public art. The Wood Museum is a visual arts organization, yet we recognize that arts include so much more than paintings and sculptures and believe that those other art forms should be, should, uh, and we believe those other art forms should be more fully embraced as we plan for the future. In addition, we are big believers in public art. A T.W. Wood Youth Education Program created the mural that is hanging on the Transportation Center wall right now. But we also understand that public art is just one piece of the overall cultural puzzle. There are countless non-public organizations, businesses, and people who contribute mightily to the Montpelier art landscape. By including museums like ours, gallery owners, music schools, theater groups, filmmakers, dance troops, and other nonprofit and for-profit organizations in the formation of a Montpelier cultural plan, you ensure that the broad spectrum of artistic and cultural voices in this community will help to shape that plan. And finally, I would like to see the Public Art Commission be reconceived and become the Arts and Culture Commission so that its purview is not simply public art, but the full gamut of the incredibly rich and vibrant art scene that we are so lucky to have here in Montpelier and that is such an important part of our economic development. Thank you so much. If you could send that to us, that would be really, uh, really great because it's not too late for us to consider making additional changes. What we've been doing this summer has been public input before we get to public, the public hearing phase. So we can still incorporate um, those changes or we can consider those changes. And mm -hmm. if you email that to us, we would be happy to go and put that on our list of things to review. Thank you so much, Michael. I'll be happy to do that. Yep. All right. All right. And we also have Zach Hughes. Zach. Um, good evening. <clears throat> I'm Zach Hughes. I'm the uh, uh, vice, uh, the uh, vice chair of the homelessness task force in Montpelier, and I also uh, do a lot of volunteer community work in Montpelier around homelessness. And I come to you uh, this evening, um, and we're talking with Complete Streets as well, um, because we also are concerned about the situation along the uh, bike path area. We monitored your meeting uh, last month um, and uh, we tried to reach out to y'all uh, about, because we want to come together with y'all at some point uh, or invite you over to the homelessness task force so you could see the work that we're doing over there. Um, but I go along that uh, path on a daily basis uh, and I know the uh, some of the players out there, um, and I take very seriously the concerns of the commission. And these concerns have also come at the council occasionally, but there's a lot of dynamics that go into this. And um, so what I offer this commission, uh, not necessarily here tonight, but going forward is to work together uh, so that we can uh, come to a good place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach. Okay, are there any other public comments? Yeah. Okay. Are, use this mic or? Uh, you can use either mic. Does this, this mic work? Because I'll... So I'm reading that Tonight's agenda is only on those three elements, public safety, community adjustments, natural resource, and economic development. And so am I at the right time to talk about other elements? Yes. And first, that also, if in a public 
engagement, it'd be good if y'all introduced yourselves because okay, great. Could you to. could you introduce yourself and I'm then we'll Steve go around? Okay, um, go around. Gabe Lajnas from Montpelier. Leah Candlin from Montpelier. Ariane Kassam. Mike Miller, staff. Maria Arsenlis from Montpelier. Sean Linehan. You're the newest on the... Yeah. Not anymore. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm now the Not newest. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd like to speak to the uh, housing and the homelessness element or the missing homelessness planning. I persuaded the city council five years ago to create the homelessness task force, and it has done about that much in five years. Uh, so I believe it should be folded in with the housing task force with an emergency housing priority. And y'all could write potentially a chapter in, uh, but regarding the uh, bike path, this alarm that was created about by, I believe the planning commission, which went to the city council resulted in the cops going over there and telling everybody they had to leave, even those who were just peaceably sitting there because they had nowhere else to go. And that's that's a concern of equal concern of the alleged harassment of school children or whatever. Um, you know, abuse of power and intimidation as ha happened to try to scare people off the Elks Club site who were peaceably camping up there uh, are concerns that should not go un unaddressed. But you may have heard that the growth center expansion, which had been approved at the state level on September 23rd, was today revoked by that same board um, on the basis of inadequate planning and lack of compliance with statutory requirements. And when my reading of the statute and the guidance from the agency that administers those programs or the two different departments that administer those programs, even the TIF district is not a sure thing with regards to the country club property. And because of its lack of walkability, its lack of a plan to have to have employment impacts, verifiable and quantified em employ employment impacts. So I believe that a lot of what I'm seeing in these storyboards and in these draft chapters uh, lack the specificity and the accountability and the performance metrics because I've spent years seeing this town say, yeah, that's a good idea, but we don't have any staff. And so I'd almost like to see all these goals and strategies uh, mapped to the critical path, which things need to precede them. And if this one fails, which other things fail in, in domino style? Because there's a lot of not good words and aspirations, but very little assurance that any of it's going to get done, you know? And to me, that's not a plan. A plan needs to be achievable, actionable, verifiable and measured against performance and changes made course corrections along the way. But I believe that you, we need a whole chapter in the plan on the country club property if we're gonna make that work. And this city's website continues to represent that the White and Burke actionable plan is adopted and it was never adopted. I've been through the minutes, I've been through the video, the minutes were corrected at the last meeting. It was never adopted. And it was considered a draft discussion document. But we're getting down to the crunch time now. We've had our growth center expansion granted, revoked, and we've got three or four months or at latest till the end of next year to reapply. But it requires a level of specificity of where your buildings are going to go, where your roads are going to go, where are the civic buildings, where's the, the financial uh, pro forma for supporting pieces of, especially of the growth center has a financial dimension to it. So I just think that we cannot allow developers to dictate what goes there. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity of having the land costs socialized across the whole city, but, but we've paid for it. And then having a lot of the infrastructure costs socialized across the whole state, if we get a TIF district. 
And that those two combined and good planning could result in some real affordable housing and some real community dynamics up there. A remote chamber like this that serves as our hot spare in case for the next flood, uh, shelter for emergency sleeping up there for people get displaced by the flood, uh, remote participation in the city council meetings that happen here, a food, a food store, clusters of homes for retired folks that don't want kids around, clusters of folks with kids, you know, but that's not what I, is in any of those Whitenberg concepts. Recognizing that the concepts in the Whitenberg plan are not a plan and that we don't have a plan and there's no plan draft in, in where it really should be in here. So I don't think we should just trust that it'll all work out but be a private developer interest. I mean, no, no, no offense. Uh, but I think we really need to consider putting an entire chapter, getting down to the specifics, that's going to both help do the homework that Mike's going to need to do to get a TIF and a growth center application in next. I talked to the board today and suggested we ask them to support changing the legislation to allow an existing town center to also have a hot spare higher higher ground town center so that in effect we get the benefits of the the program designations uh i don't want it to compete with downtown but i think it could complement downtown very well with good transportation but when green mountain transit is wiping out you know not even giving us the bathrooms according to our lease that we give them for a dollar a year, you know, and cutting routes were uh, not likely to get Green Mountain Transit to provide six or eight time a day shuttles to and from the country club. But I, I want to impress upon you, it's a once in a lifetime to have 138 acres with this kind of opportunity that could be both part of our flood resilience strategy, our emergency, our immediate emergency housing strategy for the unhoused and long-term walk to work on site workshops for woodworking, metalworking, 3D printing, you know, and have duplexes where the private apartment for a caregiver right above an ADA compliant, uh, you know. Anyway, those are some ideas, but I would ask you to recognize that our current systems do not do not anticipate or have or aren't set up to give that level of specificity that's going to, I think we could attract a developer who wants to put their name on such a beautiful planned community. Thanks. Okay. All right. Are there any other comments from the public? Put that to most of the people on Zoom there. Can we, can we time to, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. Sure. So what, what, just, you know, with regards to this comment, I mean, we haven't really been very involved in the planning commission with anything on country club bureau. There was sort of a parallel process. Yeah. Is there, is there a role that we should be taking? I mean, it's going to come into the, to the plan. So we, you know, big picture, what we're looking at with the city plan on the issue of housing and homelessness, um, just to make sure everyone's at in the same place, um, housing is talking about the physical housing and and including emergency shelters. So we put that piece, we had that conversation when we did the housing chapter and we put those pieces in there. And obviously Country Club Road is a part of our housing strategy to get more housing built in the city. We also have um, community services chapter, which isn't coming on there. That's the last three chapters. So we don't have our community services chapter yet. That's in the last three, which is community services, resilience, and land use are the last three chapters. We're doing these three. We'll get to that conversation about this is seven, eight, and nine of the 12 chapters we'll be reviewing tonight. The services for homelessness. Um, and, you know, there are many ways, many different programs we try to do to, to help people who are homeless and help people get out of homelessness. So a lot of those services are in the community services chapter. So 
it's going to kind of fall homelessness and how we help um, that population, those neighbors, they will be uh, kind of addressed in, in those two places. Country Club Road is really going to be uh, uh, a topic that will show up in a lot of chapters. So it's going to show up, but a lot of the comments of whether it's a growth center or what type of designation we go for, for that property is going to, is going to predominantly be talked about in the land use chapter, which is again, in the last three that we're talking about. Now Thank we you. held land use to the end and because state law was changing. So we need to make sure our new state laws or our new land use chapter is going to match the new state law. So we're, we've kind of waited till we no, know what no. the new rules. Thanks are for the gonna. clarification, Mike. Um, and then I guess the last point uh, on uh, to respond to Stephen's point on um, the not having the measurables. That was a, a conversation we all had as this plan was developed. And everything is is iterative. Um, we really needed to have pieces adopted. Um, in in pieces where we keep getting more and more specific. So uh in the so there's no sense going through the hundred strategies that we have and going through and assigning how what are going to be the how the measurables, what are the measurables and the performance standards until we've gone through the process of having this reviewed and adopted. It's not a requirement to have them uh, have performance standards. We have been attaching those performance standards as the city uh, has been putting them into our priority. The, the council of strategies, the council priorities, uh, we're working on more. And then we also had a lot of conversation about the fact that not everything in a city plan is necessarily measurable. Sometimes it's it's a discrete yes or no. Uh, we're going to participate in this program. We're going to um, we're going to. Uh, do a project. So uh, it's really not a measurable thing as much as it is a yes or no. Did we do it? Did we not do it? Some things are uh, lend themselves to be needing performance measures, but at the same time, we also wanted to go through and make sure we've got this adopted, make sure we're on the right path because we, we would have to spend a lot of time to go through and add those in. And if we spent all that time and then had city council or the public say, yeah, that's not really our priority. We we wasted a lot of time. So we're doing things iter iteratively. And that also goes for the Country Club Road plan. That plan that was produced did exactly what it was supposed to. It was a conceptual plan. It was what we had called a master plan. They The council changed the name of it. But it was really meant to be a conceptual plan. We have to take things in steps. We can't say where the buildings are going to be and how big they are until we've had a conversation and laid things out and said, okay, this is what we heard high density five story buildings here lower density townhouses and condos up here on the upper part now we have to have a public discussion you know we had we had a you know a 6 month 9 month process of taking public input this is what we heard and then we presented to council and say this is what we heard is this the plan we're going to go forward with albeit conceptual because there's no sense us going in and designing things until we've had an understanding that, yeah, we all agree there's going to be four or five story buildings in the lower area and smaller buildings on the on the hillsides. And once we have that, then we can go forward to the next step to say, okay, what would it take? How much detail do we need to go to the next level? And that's what will happen with that plan. Um, and how much of that plan ends up in this land use plan is going to depend on what you and the council want to have in it. So touching on i'm sorry can you say that again how much of what plan is of the of the plan? of the master plan for country club road oh how, how much, much of that plan gets in integrated into okay. this or how much of it do we just say in here as we have in the the strategies we have a strategy for country club road that'll go through and say you know one of our strategies for creating more housing is to continue with that project which is going to run on its own tract and, you know, talking about whether it's growth centers or town centers, both of which have gone away under the new legislation. So um, with the loss of the growth center, it's probably not coming back. We're probably not going to expand that. That's um, that'll be probably one that will go away just because the amount of time it's going to take to go through to get that 
adopted into a growth center and the program the program's over the state isn't going to continue that program so it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to invest a lot of money in designating that area into a program that's going to be going away we were moving to simply expand our existing growth center to include that so um so that'll probably you know delay a couple of years um the work up there but we will continue to work on that and to, and to advance that project at whatever pace we can. So, um, but if we're set, I can go forward and. Can I make one comment on that uh -huh. clarification? Do you want to come to the mic? Yeah, the, the growth center program is not ending the way uh, you might think of what you just heard, that growth center, new growth centers will not be granted, but existing growth centers will continue to exist. And they, the order, the legal memo that came out this week related to this revocation uh, said we have until next September, I think, or December to apply to re-expand our growth center. But the key thing here is that specificity that I'm asking you to put in the plan is the same specificity that's required to get the growth center. And that's why I'm asking for it, because I trust this process uh, more than the staff council process. Uh, this is the group, and I'd even like to see this group expanded beyond six plus one vacant. You know, if we're going to really tackle this level of detail to earn the growth center in the TIF district, uh, it needs more participation. The the issue with growth centers they have it they have an, a set timeline. They were set for twenty years, so we are currently at year fifteen and a half. So that's why I'm saying, in in four and a half years, it goes away and disappears, and it can't be renewed. So that's why putting a lot of effort in for a, what would effectively be a three-year continuation of the growth center doesn't make a lot of sense when we could go through and apply for a different designation that doesn't have an expiration date, such as designated downtowns. Or, But they've kind of scrapped the old system, and we're going to be waiting for new rules as to what the new system is going to be. So. So there's going to be a new system for growth centers or uh, there won't be they've so they are different designations. It's a completely 181 went through and took if, if people are aware there, there's like uh, growth centers, what should be easier to start at the, the top. You've got designated downtowns and village centers. So you hear a lot about that. We have a designated downtown. They're required to have an organization. That's Montpelier Alive. They have set things they're responsible for. Village centers is just a smaller version of that. Um, those are the two designated centers, and then they they used to have um, neighborhoods, new town centers, and growth centers. Each one having its own their own sets of of things. What happened was they they kind of wiped the slate clean and said we're not going to be having these designations anymore. We're going to have something that's called a a center, but they haven't really set the rules out, but they're going to grandfather the designated downtowns and the new town centers into those designations. And then there's going to be another set of designations that they're going to be coming up with, but they haven't really come up with the rules and what they're going to be yet. There's a new board that is going to come up with those. So um, we have some ideas of what things are going to be. And we'll talk about this a lot more when we get to the land use chapter of how we set up our land use chapter and our land use map to as best as possible, as best we can guess, set ourselves up for what we think will be the designations. So we probably won't have names for them. We'll probably have to you know, rely on some of these other ones until they come up with exactly how they're gonna be titling these new, these new programs. So, but I'll try, I'll keep working with the state. I'm hoping I'll be in a conference the next couple of days and I'm hoping to learn a little bit more about where they think these new designations are gonna be going because that's why we've waited as long as we did on the land use chapter, because we really want to make sure these are going to match up. We want to match up our land use chapter, because what we don't want to do is to be in the position we're in right now, where we have a growth center and we buy the property that's right next to the growth center. And you're like, I wish I just put that in in the first place, or I wish it was 
in the city plan, so I could just go and put that piece in. But it isn't in the city plan, so that was one of the issues. So if we can make a plan that has a little bit more generalized boundaries, we might have a little easier time allowing uh, if there's new opportunities that come up. Because sometimes you just don't know where an opportunity is going to present itself, and you want to have the tools available to make good projects happen. Um, so. Yeah. I just want, well, I think we've heard this comment about specificity before in the city plan. And so I thought it would just be worth revisiting for all of us, whether we all still think that, you know, that we kind of like toe that line because, uh, I mean, you can put it in specifics, but is city council really going to hamstring itself to it, the specifics that we come up with, you know, and then they are the ones that will be judged if they don't reach those milestones. Um, so I think it's like a conversation worth having, you know, I think we do it in some places like the 30 house, the 30 units of housing. Um, so there are some places where we put in numbers, but I, don't know, I think it's just, it's a worthwhile conversation. Yeah. Part of it is that, yeah, that this is a, you know, eight years worth of plan and that if we put in specifics, a lot of specifics, that we are hamstringing ourselves down the line when something changes. And I don't know what is going to happen, but I know that something that we don't expect <laughs> is going to happen. So flexibility is part of the plan, an important part of the plan, is to have flexibility. And that's why we shy away from the specifics. We have a specific number of houses because, you know, Mike had brought that point up at some point because you know, this is, like you said, we've hashed this out before. But Mike was saying that, you know, we need to add this many number of units. And yeah, there's a rationale for that number. And is it, if you don't meet that goal, which it's a good chance you won't. <laughs> Uh, it's still a good goal to have. Well, I think that's a good question. Thanks for drawing out the larger theme there, Maria. Well, I think as we the city plan, yeah. you know, so we've gotten the comment before. Yes, yeah. I think there, there are probably times to not be specific, and there are times, like you're saying, to be specific, and just making sure that we're weighing that the right way. Okay. Um, hearing no other public comments, uh, I think we should move to the public input session. Okay. And so you can take us through these storyboards or chapters. There we go. All right. So we're going to just quickly go through, give everybody kind of the background of um, the city plan. Give a quick background, a um, little bit of, you know, what is a city plan? Why is it important? Um, to talk about how our plan is laid out. Uh, and then get some overall input process. You guys are okay with that. We can do that. That'll... Um, so, big thing, where to find the plan. So, if you go to our city website and you scroll down, and I'll show this later on, uh, when we go to look at the documents, you'll see there's a box or sometimes you have to hit the little carrot and move it over so we can go through and see this guy. And if you click on this guy, it will take you to a page which has uh, these icons in some conversation above, which these icons are will take you to the various storyboards, as we call them. Those are the chapters. 
And down below, they have the PDFs of the implementation strategies, which are the the kind of the, the boards that have the aspirations, the goals, and the strategies. So um, some of the background and history. For the first 50 years, Montpelier had what we called the Montpelier Master Plan. And that is actually still in effect today. The most recent update was in uh, 2010 and was amended in 2017. Uh, with this new format, we're changing it to the uh, Montpelier City Plan, uh, really because master plan is kind of a term of art, and this isn't a master plan. This is a city plan. So we decided as a commission, or the planning commission decided to uh, adjust the name. So we've been calling it now the, the Montpelier City Plan. It's a new format, new content. Uh, it's completely rewritten. And this process actually started back in 2016 with developing goals and strategies, uh, worked with different committees and commissions. Uh, so the Historic Preservation Commission on the Historic Plan, housing, uh, the Housing Plan, uh, MEAC for the Energy Plans, and so forth. So it's a web-based plan format with separate chapters for each topic. So that was another conversation that we had. Um, do we want to have another paper document that we all, you know, hold in our hands, or did we want to go to a new web-based format? And the reason we went to web-based format is kind of where things are going now. Most of the, the, the plans across the country are going to more of a web-based format. And so we'll be probably one of the first ones in Vermont to make that shift, but um, I don't know if anyone's beat us to it because it's we've been working on it for a while. And that will come back in a moment. Has to just think about it and read. Sorry on your glove. <laughs> oh yeah, I got my neon sweatshirt on. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's uh, there's a new format for the web-based separate chapters, and there's also a new format for the aspirations, goals, and strategies. So we our goal was to have a more actionable plan. We'll talk about this more later. So what is a city plan? Why is it important? I guess the first thing to mention is plans are not required under state law. We have no requirement to adopt a city plan. Um, but if you don't have a city plan, uh, you don't have the ability to adopt or update your zoning. Uh, you also don't have the ability to influence state proceedings. So that's like Act 250. If there's an Act 250 application, the city would not be allowed to participate in that Act 250 process or Section 248. And in many times, city plans are a requirement or will give you bonus points uh, in order to qualify for state and federal grants. But if you want to have a state law, then you have to meet these four requirements. And that is to be consistent with the state planning goals of 4302 uh, of Title 24, uh, to be compatible with the regional plan, to be compatible with other plans in the region, and to contain the 12 elements of 24 VSA 4382. And those 12 elements, not directly, but in many ways are why we have 12 chapters, because they have requirements for land use, energy, transportation, housing. Um, so we have, in many ways, kind of have a parallel track with these 12. It's not, not one for one. That's kind of how we end up with the, the chapters that we do. Um, so how can a city plan be used? Uh, it's really a foundational document. Uh, it really is up to the city or town to decide how they want to use the plan. It can be a long-term guide, can be a basis for decision-making making on program and investment, um, an action plan with implementation steps, it can be as specific or as general as a community wants to make it. Um, but it's also a basis for regulations, a source of information, uh, and a source for strategic plans and studies, tool for coordination, and standards for st uh, state regulatory proceedings. So lots of ways we can be using this plan. Um, and we'll go back to, we've talked about this a little bit. What were the Planning Commission's goals when we put this all together? Uh, for the storyboards, it was to give the public and decision makers the background on the topic. What are our goals? And generally, what are we going to try to do to achieve them? It's to try to, if people wanted to know what is Montpelier doing about housing, they could look at the storyboard, read through it, and have a general understanding of what we're doing about housing. 
if you tend to be more of a policy wonk and you really want to get into the details, uh, that's where the strategies and the implementation plan comes in. And that was meant to be an actionable plan to achieve the aspirations and, and goals. And um, one of the criticisms of our current plan, and you'll see in many plans, is that they tend to be too fluffy to have uh, actual steps. So for us, we tried to have a, a broad visionary aspiration that we would then break into different goals, each with discrete bites that you could take at it. So the example we like to use is uh, if you want to have safe and affordable housing, that might be your aspiration, but you're going to have a goal for safe housing and another goal for affordable housing because how the strategies we're going to use to make safe housing are going to probably be different than the strategies we're going to use to make affordable housing. So then the question would be, okay, what are the actual steps we're going to take? And those are the strategies. And we broke the strategies into a number of different pieces. You know, some are regulations, which are permits, some are more plans, some are programs, which are ongoing things, and some are projects, um, like build a transit center. You're only going to build one transit center. You're only going to build one country club road. So those are projects uh, so that your strategy is to implement the project or implement the program. And then those boards that talk about the strategies have a paragraph or two to explain what that strategy is. But obviously more detail would have to come at a later time with more specifics. But that's that's the big picture. So we wanted to have the storyboards give people an opportunity to um, understand the issue. That's what the storyboards are. And then the strategies are for people who really want to know the details and also for the council and the staff to advance things. It gives us an eight-year window. The plan is going to be good for eight years. We have an eight-year window. How are we going to get these steps done within the eight years? That's that's what we need to continue to work with council on to, to move these forward. Uh, through the process. So what was the process for adopting this plan or working on this plan? As we said, we're in the public input stage. Um, we developed 12 chapters or we're in the process of developing 12 chapters. We decided at the start, we would review three chapters at a time and it would probably take four to six months. It's six months, seven months now. We got a little bit behind in September and October, but um, We've got six of the chapters that are developed. They are um, being updated and put online. The updated versions are going online. We're reviewing the next three right now. And then we will have three more that we hope to review in late November or December. Uh, the hope would be we would have the input done by the end of this calendar year. That's still my goal. So each of these um, we'll have different input opportunities plus comments online through surveys. So we want to give as many opportunities as we can. Once all of the input is complete, um, we'll review all the comments and make revisions to develop a final public hearing draft. And when that public hearing process is ready, when it's ready, we will begin the public hearing process, which would require at least can't remember, it's always different between, they make them slightly different between adoption of zoning and adoption of plans, but I believe it's one public hearing minimum for the planning commission and two minimum for city council. But my experience has been, we usually have as many hearings as is necessary to review the plan. It's a big document. There are a lot of changes. So um, I've had hearings, whether it's been zoning or plans, some of which have been just the minimum and some of which have taken 20 meetings at city council to get approved. It'll take as long as it does, but the hope is um, because we've taken the time to have public input before going to public hearing that we've addressed a lot of the concerns. So tonight's topics, natural resource, public safety and community justice. Uh, that's one chapter, public safety and community justice. And then the third is economic development. As we mentioned, each of these three chapters has two parts. Uh, each chapter above has a storyboard and implementation strategies, and all nine pieces all nine pieces are on the city website. Um, but eventually, these will all be on their own website, and that might be coming up when we get to the last three. I don't know if we'll quite have it ready right now. They're on the city's website, but 
when this plan is done, it's going to be in a different, it's going to have its own website. So um, some of the, there are a few technical issues when you get into the document that occasionally pop up, we keep fixing them. Um, but they're there because of the fact that we are duplicating the website because otherwise you'd end up inside of a website that's only half built. And then we would be getting a lot of comments. Why doesn't this work? Why doesn't that work? Why doesn't that work? Why doesn't that work? Because it's not built yet. So we just took the pieces out. We put them on our website and say, these are the pieces that work. Let's get comments. And as we plug them into the full website, then it'll have more detailed. Um, and we've kind of gone over these pieces. Um, so this is an example of the transportation plan. This is what you'd see if you go online. And this is kind of what you see when we talk about the implementation strategies, that's on the right. When we talk about the storyboard, that's what's on the left. So the rest of tonight, I'll leave the PowerPoint and bring up each of the storyboards and strategies and we can walk through them. There's actually a lot of storyboards or a lot of implementation strategies for public safety because there is one for each of the, the four public safety and um, uh, community justice pieces. So those that's actually four separate pieces. And then we also have one for economic development and one for natural resources. So what we really are looking for, these, these are, these are our drafts and people, the people at home don't see this, the blue screen, they still see it. Every, it's good. Um, but what do you like? What do you not like about the various elements? Do you have specific comments about the content? Are there topics or strategies that are missing? You know, sometimes we're talking about things, Hey, we should be doing this, um, to help economic development. And, um, Maybe you have ideas that we didn't consider. Um, do you have questions that we can answer? You can always email questions. If you happen to be viewing this on Orca at a later time, you can email me and that's my email address. So just like everybody else in the city, it is first first letter, last name. So M Miller at Montpelier-VT.org. So going to, unless there's a, question right now, I will jump out of this. I think I go here, I get to, so this is the city's website. So as I mentioned, I'll just go through this really quick. If you're on the, if you're looking for where, where can I find all this? If you scroll down, we have a number of boxes here. And I'll point out also, my planning department has moved. Uh, we've moved for the third time now since the flood. We used to be in the basement of City Hall. That flooded. We lost a lot of our stuff. And we've moved around, and we are now in our hopefully last temporary space at uh, One Blanchard Court, which is the Leonine Building. So if you're looking for us, looking for permits, that's where you can find us. A little sidetrack. But if you hit the side arrow, it'll go around till you see the city plan. Click on the city plan and you will come to this page where you can scroll down. It'll have some uh, information on the process. And as we mentioned, nine icons. So if you click on this icon, you'll go to the natural resources storyboard, economic development, and public safety, but you can also review any of these. And if you have comments on any of these, feel free to um, send us an email, give us some input because we always want to hear more uh, and, and see what we can find out. The last thing we want to do is to be in the public hearing process and then find out we've missed something important. Uh, and these down below are the PDFs that take you to the implementation plans. And we're mostly looking at these bottom ones uh, utilities and facilities uh, got shuffled out of order, unfortunately, but natural resources, economic development, and then the four public safeties. So I already pulled these up. So let's see what we've got here. So the um, see why where's mine we'll start with natural resources so 
Um, we'll go through this one because a little bit more straightforward. So natural resources implementation plan. Oh, actually, do you want me to go through the storyboard first? Let me go through the storyboard first. So the storyboards, um, natural resources, protecting and stewarding uh, Montpelier's landscape. So this was developed, and this is one of the issues we've been having. If you just hit OK or cancel, it'll go away. So if it pops up again, you can hit OK. Um, this was developed with the Conservation Commission and Parks Commission. So it all of these open the same way with a brief introduction, giving you a little bit of an idea of what natural resources talking about. And uh, this is our plan for protecting our natural resources, protect and steward our landscape and natural resources, and to be a compact settlement with constant concentrated development to reduce development pressures on the surrounding countryside. We then move into the planning context, which gives us some of the background of um, the plan. And a, the most of the planning context is really developed on the maps. So we've got a little bit of a formatting issue, which they've been working on. Um, but what you can do when you're on the page is you literally can drag around and move these maps and you can zoom in. So maybe you want to find out, find your house, move in and you can do that. So here we go. We've got city hall and route two, um, but you can turn on various layers. So these are the wetlands that are in town. These are the significant natural communities. So you can go through, and as we said, you got significant communities, you can zoom in and move around the city. And that's the advantage of these kind of a dynamic map. And we're trying to work out a few of these pieces to make sure that everything is correct um, on all these layers. Those should be the ones that are in the zoning bylaws that we protect. Same here, we've got our steep slopes, we've got our floodplains, and we've got the North Branch River Corridor. So these are all in our zoning regulations. So these are the development limitations maps. So I think these were natural communities, uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. The second is a group of development limitations. So if you were to do a development, you might wanna know where the floodplains are. And this is the city's flood, the flood map. So I'll have to adjust the transparency on that one. So um, you should be able to see through them. So that's why I said adjust the transparency. They've been working on these over the weekend and we've got a couple of more that we've got to work on. But information is correct. So the forest blocks and those are the forest. Yep. A little typo scroll up in the title. Um, it's at forest blocks. Ooh. Just need to add Good that catch. T. Landslide risks areas. Uh, there is no state data on that one, um, but we do have the steep slopes where they're most likely to occur. But I don't believe the state has come out with a map of the uh, with the landslide risk. Although it'd be interesting after this last uh, set of events last sets of floods, all the, with the amount of landslides, it'd be interesting to see if the state geology and geologists are working on that. Um, would we do that before this plan is finished? Oh, that wouldn't happen. That would probably take the state a long time, but as they get them, we can certainly update. And that's the other goal of our plan is that we don't intend to, in the same way with the city with the city zoning, we went through and did a very big update, and then we went through every year to go through and do more updates. Our goal with this city plan is to do a really big update and then to keep going through every year and maybe looking at a chapter. So that way, every year, 18 months, 
we can go back and revisit one for you know whatever reason maybe after 2008 2009 um economic development crash when we had the the great recession you know maybe that would have been a good time to just look at the economic development plan and and take a fresh look at it because it's something new and different and maybe after the the flood last year we would have been looking at the resilience plan so the idea is things come up which you just don't expect and that will trigger us to go through and say we need to go and take a harder look at housing or homelessness or something else and and that's some of the goal um, so if we had new data that came out, we could certainly then go through and update the map. So we have our introduction, we have our plan context. The synergies part is to help people understand when we talk about something, it's really hard to talk about natural resources without talking about a whole bunch of other things. So we wanted to just have a take a moment to talk about how natural resources affects land use and utilities and transportation because all of these things start to overlap. If we want to protect our natural resources, our roads are creating stormwater runoff and are creating pollutants. And these are the different, you know, our natural resources, which also include our steep slopes, will affect our land use. How can we develop? Where can we develop? And so this section of synergy starts to talk about how this chapter and whatever chapter you're talking about, economic development. Economic development is going to relate to a lot of chapters. Historic resources is going to relate to a lot of chapters. And it's to take a moment to say, we're talking just about this one piece, but let's all remember this piece affects a lot of other pieces. And then the implementation summary. And these match what's in the plan that, we talk, that we'll be talking about later. Um, so those are the goals that go with that um strategy or uh, go with that aspiration so as we said aspirations are big they break into a number of pieces um for goals and then we'll have strategies to accomplish the goals and then there's just a summary that goes through and says there are a number of strategies that will help us accomplish the four primary objectives of understanding resources engagement conservation and protection of resources um and then this goes through and says this is how we're going to meet these goals. In the future, this will link. You click this, it'll take you to the implementation plan. Um, again, these aren't active because we're not in the full website. And then the last piece is who's involved. So if you want to understand natural resources, who, who's who's involved? Who's working on this? So we've got the, the Conservation Commission, uh, the Parks Commission, you know, the Conservation Commission is looking at things in a, in a general sense. The Parks Commission is looking at the land that we own. In some cases, our parks are used for recreation. In some cases, our parks are conserved lands. Um, and so we also have a tree board, um, park staff, public work staff. Um, and the public works are working on items such as our, our urban ecology and our water quality. A lot of water quality issues and initiatives come through our public works department and planning department working in, in our, our world for uh, national flood insurance. And so that's a general overview, not getting in, not really getting into the specifics. Um, you know, we hope people take the time to go through, kind of read through each of the pieces, but um it's a, in a general sense, this is what we're each one of these chapters would look at with their various um, maps. And so I don't know if you want me just to jump into economic development real quick, or we could take a minute if there are questions on natural resources. Like I always like to show people the goals just so that they can like look at something concrete and see. Any feedback they can want to so, on the spot. Um, so uh just jumping back to the natural resources, these are the just I gotta shrink this up in my screen so I can see it. The aspirations and goals that went along with natural resources. So our aspiration, again, it's our big thing. Montpelier will have resilient and healthy environment through stewardship and protection of our heritage and resources. Um so that's what we're trying to do. So how would we do that? 
Uh, we would do that through six goals. Maintain a documented, mapped, up-to-date inventory of our natural resources and heritage to support informed decision-making. So one goal is to make sure everything is documented and mapped. Can't protect it if we don't understand it. Uh, number two, improve citizen engagement in conservation and natural resource inventory projects within city limits on public and private lands. So um, making sure people are involved in the process, um, people understand, then people care. Um, three, maintain healthy and high quality surface waters that support a variety of ecological and recreational uses. Four, maintain a thriving community of native flora and fauna and eradicate or control the spread of invasive species populations. Uh, number five, reduce Montpelier's impact on and reliance to uh, and, and resilience to climate change and use city land to mitigate the effects to ensure resiliency for natural communities. And six, maintain and protect the city's soil resources from contamination or erosion. Seven, acquire and maintain parkland and easements where ownership of these parcels and rights best achieve the long-term protection of the natural resource and heritage of Montpelier. And eight, enhance the protection of the city's urban ecology. So uh, the idea on a lot of these, which you'll notice the, the first word, maintain or improve, we were trying to go through and make sure that we have this understanding within the goal of are we doing a good job and we have to keep doing what we're doing or are we not doing a good job and we need to do a better job. So that's why you see some of these are like maintain a thriving community of flora and fauna. We think we've got a thriving community, but it's not going to stay that way if we don't provide certain level of protection. So that's why we're talking about maintaining it. Um, certainly somebody might go through and say it's, it's not thriving, in which case we would amend that to say improve or you know some 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 other word in in front like number 5 reduce montpelier's impact and resilience to climate change so inherent in reading that is uh the conservation commission and and parks commission believe we aren't doing good enough job and we um and we need to reduce our impact uh, so but we want to increase our resilience too. But that could be that. Yeah, that would be good consideration. Number five, natural resources, because the first one is reduce, and the second one would be. Increase resilience. Okay. And we may go through and evaluate this because when we developed this, we had 11 chapters and we did not have a chapter on resilience. So this plan was kind of meant to capture that, that requirement, capture that piece in there. Um, so we may go through afterwards and maybe make an adjustment to natural resources to make sure that it's it's in there just like we'll probably go through into the storyboard and add resilience. Oh, I have to make sure that you mute. That was uh, yeah. Steve Wells was on there. All oh, that's all right. So that was some of the so these are in so these are the goals. So as we said, we've got our big aspiration, we've got our goals, and again, a big something is is natural resources isn't a really finite thing. It's it's pretty broad, which is why you're going to have a number of goals. Um, and then the strategies are laid out below. And again, you've got this continue means that's something we're already doing. Uh, develop probably means we, something we ha we aren't doing and we need to do um, to do new. So we talk about continuing an Emerald Ash Borer program, program. We already have one. This is what the city tree board and um, our city arborist are working on the fact that we have emerald ash borer. It's going to kill all of our ash trees. We want to save some ash trees, but we also need to take down all those other ones. So this talks about how how much of a priority is it? It's a high priority. What's its cost? It's a medium cost. So medium cost is up to $100,000. Um, 
and it implements eight. That's mostly our urban ecology that we're talking about. And it's the who's responsible, the Parks and Trees Department. So we go through and have a number of these, whether that's the zoning regulations over here on the right, which have a number of goals. So the zoning regulations work to help implement goals number three, four, six, and eight. Um, so there are a number of goals. In some cases, it's just a single establish a conservation outreach program that helps us with number two. Um, and some of these are new. As we said, some of these are um, continuing existing programs. Uh, develop a natural resources inventory initiative, um, stream bank restoration program. So some of these are ones that we're, we're using our volunteers for, expand and continue. We already have a volunteer conservation program, uh, the Youth Conservation Corps, um, but there's conversations we, we could do more if we could expand it. So continue the street tree program, conduct a survey of existing dams. So Again, all of these have different priorities, uh, implement different goals. Some of them are the Parks Department, some of them are the Conservation Commission. So that gives you an idea if you have the time to go through. It's uh, that's, that's where another place where we're looking to get some input on. Sometimes it's making sure we have the right words. Is that the right word or should we have a different word? Um, Everybody pretty good on natural resources. Are you going to you either finish the presentation and then talk about them, or you want to take comments along the way? Um, uh, do you want to do one set of do all natural resources and then do all economic development? Yeah, and do that, all public safety. That makes sense to me. If people, if the members of the public have comments on natural resources, to make them now. I don't know who else is in the meeting. I can't see the. Yeah, I've got the screen up. So if people put their hands up, I can see them. But otherwise, we'll, we can jump over to economic development and then public safety. And I have a few comments on natural resources if you want them now. Okay. Why don't you go ahead? Um, but I don't have enough light to read my own note. Get my phone out. Or if we don't need this screen. Well, if you want, I can just turn the lights back on for a minute. Uh, and again, if you if you have a bunch that you want to email us, you're welcome to, or if no, you want to go through them. Some of them are about process. I, I like the potential of the web form, but I think it's too much too soon. I think the technology has immense potential, but it's a distraction from the real policy discussions we should be having. So maybe the next iteration or the update process after the, this is a full redo this time, and then you're talking about an annual update process. Maybe the annual update process could really be done in the web format, but just explaining how this web works, I, I prefer a paper copy that I can work from and I've asked for them. Um, the Technology that's being used here is is good technology developed by Esri, which is the world leader in GIS, and I support that direction. And they call it uh, story maps. So I think it's a little confusing for us to call them storyboards, um, because it really is the map that uh, distinguishes it from just a, a busy. Uh, but. So that's that's kind of background to the two. Natural resources, are we going to do inventories on private land, whether invited or not? Because it did say private land, and some people might take issue with us finding that elusive little fern or flower. Uh, Most natural resource inventories are done remotely at this point through satellite and through other other data. So most of it is done through remote sensing, less of it is done nowadays. Okay, so Actual, there, there may be ground confirmations that come through, and from time to time, they they ask permission. But the planning commission, and certainly other folks, uh, uh, they did. I guess the best example would be two thousand six, two thousand eight. They did the natural community survey. They hired a company 
come in and do a natural community survey of all the natural communities in Montpelier. And yeah, did they have to get consent from pro if property they owner? if they wanted to go onto a property owner, they had to get consent. But most of it they're able to do through remote sensing. There's a lot that can be done now with, you know, certain trees right. give off certain UV. So if you take right. the picture with certain filters, you can see where certain species of trees are. And so you can define the natural community. Yeah, based but on. The, these lit, rare little flowers that they're finding that they thought were extinct or coming back. I don't know whether we have any or not, but I guess my point is it that's not going to be show up in remote sensing. But I noticed that the inventory of natural resources was a missing piece of our country club road or our growth center application, you know, are there any sensitive natural resources that we need to have mapped already and we needed to supply those maps? Uh, so that illustrates the connection between what we're doing and our time sensitive. Uh, uh, when we say healthy service waters, I've been critiquing this for years. You know, it took three or four years to get the city to pull a shopping cart out of the river right behind Avishan. And finally, Frazier got, didn't want to be embarrassed at another city council meeting. So the police chief and deputy chief come and find me at the library. And we walk, show me where, show me where the cart is. And we got it pulled out this week. But the amount of litter and garbage and even toxins that sit on our riverbanks it's like we can write all this great stuff, but if we don't have a system to pick it up, look down off the Main Street Bridge down at the bank below Shaw's at the amount of garbage that's every high water, it's floating down river. And how do we address our PFAS contribution and our combined sewer overflow contribution? Until it's gonna be a decade before we get our stormwater separated from our sewer, and every time we have a big rain, we're dumping raw sewage right in the river, right below where, right above where people swim. So I'm a little, I guess I'm, I think it would be more honest to include that kind of information in our, instead of just saying, oh, we're so righteous, you know, but we really aren't walking our talk right now. And I'd like to see us do better, but I don't know how. In fact, that's what I'd like to see in the plan is timeline strategies to get the combined sewer overflow remedied. Or how are we, who's responsible to go below Shaw's and gather that stuff or go under the railroad bridge and gather the buckets and bicycles and cones and everything out of the river. So those are my comments on natural resources. Okay. All right, so we'll jump, well, let's see, economic development. So the storyboard, uh, so again, uh, it's overview of Montpelier's goals on economic prosperity. Um, so uh, historically, we've benefited from stability across a variety of important job sectors, state government, finance, and insurance um, has provided a solid foundation for the city's economy. However, broad shifts in retail and work environments have brought changes to the economic activity in the city. So really, the, the start of this is trying to kick off some of the changes that are going on that we all know about. Um, we know people are doing more remote work. We used to have thousands of state workers that came into town. They no longer come into town. They all work remotely. So that has an impact on um, our economic uh, profile. Uh, so uh, we also divided ec economic development, the conversation of economic development into two pieces. It's you know more than just a number of businesses. Um, it's also personal to people. Uh, there's not only the business, but there's the worker, the person who is there. So we try to look at economic development in two, two different buckets. Uh, one being how do we help our our businesses and our and our economic development in that side, and how do we work with our workers and make sure they have what they need to be successful. Uh, so uh, we also added to everyone 
every chapter has a did you know. We try to find some interesting factoid. Um, so did you know employment in Montpelier is 60% private sector? A lot of people think all of our jobs in Montpelier are with the state. They're actually not. The state does have a big footprint. 30% of our jobs are state jobs, but 60% of our jobs are private sector jobs. And the remaining 10% are city and federal jobs. Uh, so again, our our background, which I actually have to go through and it's amazing how you can look at these so many times. And then when you do the presentation, you're like, that should say play in context. Because economic development is one of the first ones we started to work on, and then it kind of got shelved and we kind of sat on it. And so it hasn't been updated to match the correct format. So uh, again, we've got conversation of a little bit of the background before we get into So a little bit of our, our profile, there, there are less maps associated with the economic development. There'll be a couple, but most of it's really tied to some of the background and information. We've got a highly educated workforce. Um, but our local economy has historically <laughs> been dependent on significant number of low paying service jobs, which are filled by people who live in neighboring communities. So, you know, we, we've got this little bit of a dynamic where we need both, um, both folks. And that's, that's hard because we don't have necessarily the transportation networks to support everybody. Um, and that was really the message that comes through for workers is transportation child care and uh oh housing costs and housing housing were the those were the three that that are the three biggest issues for workers um so economic development since 2000 there's a lot that the city's done uh 1999 was when we became a designated downtown this is our designated downtown um the borders have adjusted over time Uh, but it's focused on uh, four main areas, downtown beautification, events, marketing, and promotion. So those are really the big things that Montpelier Alive is our group that works on that. Uh, provide some benefits, Act 250, future designations. Um, so this was obviously not here to reflect what was uh, today, but this is where we will go in to put in what is going to be our new what do we want for our new secondary area we know we know this area this area will probably remain the same under the new state program but what's our new program that's going to go around that and support that and what should the boundaries of that be so if i zoom out a little bit you get an idea of this is our existing growth center. We actually still have an existing growth center. It hasn't gone away. We just didn't get to add the country club road property onto it. So we will still be a designated growth center. Um, but what do we want for uh, the future boundary? Um, because this will only be here for four and a half years, then it goes away. So what's going to replace it? Uh, and again, as I mentioned, synergies with other plans, um, Economic development is affected by a number of different things. Uh, we, as we learned last year, resilience, um, our ability to bounce back from floods, economic development, last year's flood had tremendous economic impacts. Um, community services, natural resources. Um, there's a, a big effort to try to tie and have more economic growth tied to our, um, our parks and recreation as a foundation, as another pillar. You know, we know our economy is changing. Having recreation as a as another pillar to draw people into town would would help our overall diversify our, our economic profile. Transportation has always been tied to economics. Why why is Montpelier where it is? It's got two rail lines. 
it's the junction of two rail lines with a third rail line. Um, so we've got three different rail lines that came through town. Now there's only the two, but originally there were separate rail lines, three separate rail lines, as well as um, the interstate highway. So transportation has a huge impact on economic development and the same with housing. Um, and again, transportation is also big because um, Montpelier has more jobs than we have people that live in the city. So, uh, or uh, people that are in the workforce. I think it has been bigger than the population of the city in the past. Right now, according to the 2020 census, we have 6,337 jobs. There are only 4,000 workers in the workforce. So we have to have 1,000 people have to come in from out of town to fill these. Oh, well, that's not what that says. That says 1,000 are filled by residents. Oh, are filled by residents. So 5,000 okay. people have to come okay. to town. Yeah. Yep. Just, just checking that with yeah. the price. <laughs> yeah, it's a, huge, it's a huge number. That's why people are always like, why is parking an issue? 5,000 people have to come to town every day who don't live in Montpelier to go to work. So, um, but that's no not true now since the this is census data from census data from 2020, ago. and so we that we only get that data every 10 years. So unfortunately, it's going to be really hard to update that. We know anecdotally that there's probably not that many people because there's less parking. That you can see there's more open parking spaces, so less there are more people working remotely. So. Yes. So uh, aspirations. So this uh, economic development breaks into two pieces. The first piece is to talk about um, Montpelier would be a great place for people in the workforce to live. It's talking about our workers. Community will provide equal access to employment through available housing opportunities, specifically affordable housing and services, specifically childcare and transportation for all members of the workforce. The city will connect these workers to the region and state resources that are available for workforce development. So we're talking a lot about how do we work with goals, um, with these goals to connect people to um, to jobs and to have our labor force succeed. And then we have Montpelier will maintain a robust local economy by supporting quality private developments and ensuring those projects have access to ample infrastructure. So this is what can we do to help those new businesses come to town? When I got here, uh, we had an opportunity. Caledonia Spirits was interested in moving to town, but it was going to take some work and we needed to help them uh, get through some infrastructure issues and to make it worthwhile for them to invest here rather than say Waterbury or Barry City or somewhere else. They, they wanted to come here. And so how do we make a, a good environment infrastructure wise um, and with programs to help businesses succeed here? Um, and that's what this is looking at, the business side of what can we do? Uh, improving building stock, uh, maintaining and improving our sense of place. And then the summary, this, this again, summarizes what we'll see in that strategy sheet when we pull it up. Who's involved? Most of this comes out of my office, the planning and community development. We have somebody on staff who is the uh, community and economic development specialist. So we had... Since I've been here, we had a, we didn't have an economic development group. We created an economic development group separate from the city. We funded it. Uh, we had an economic development strategic plan, and then that group folded, and we took that back in house. So we've kind of gone all the way around, and we're now doing a lot of our economic development work in house. Understanding that there's also regional partners that we work with, Central Vermont Economic Development. Um, and other partners that we work with. But, uh, and Montpelier Alive is obviously a part of our economic development strategy in the Chamber of Commerce. So if we're back here, again, same thing. We just talked about what were our two aspirations. We talked about the goals, increase the quant quantity, quality, and affordability of our housing and childcare as they're essential to a thriving and successful workforce. 
Additionally, maintaining a mix of land uses and improving access to affordable public transportation are key to a fair and equitable access for employment for all residents. We want everyone to have equal access to opportunities. Um, and those are what we feel are the three key pieces to access. And then improve development of our workforce by connecting them with education and training. Continue to improve our business and economic climate to encourage and support businesses. Increase the number of local businesses through retention and expansion programs and uh, promote startup and entrepreneurship with a goal of increasing the number of full-time jobs by 100 per year. This was something the Planning Commission added in uh, a little while ago. Um, and I'm still personally not sure we need to add more jobs considering we already have more jobs and we have people, more jobs we add, more traffic comes in, but we'll, we can always talk about the impacts of that. Improving our building stock to make it more flexible and efficient and well-maintained, maintain and improve the quality of our supply and supply, quality of our supply of necessary utilities and facilities. So, um, and maintain and improve our sense of place and the quality of our public and built environment. And then again, we have a number of strategies. How would we accomplish these six goals? The first two targeting labor, the last four targeting business. Well, we've got outreach and marketing programs. We have a tax stabilization program. It's actually on the council agenda next month to review that. Uh, create a new economic development revolving loan fund. We had one in the past, um, but there isn't very much money in it. We need to evaluate it. We think it would be a good idea. It would, it would help startups potentially. Continue participation in the growth center program. Create a neighborhood development area program. That's an, another separate program. We're going to have to kind of adjust that one now, knowing that that's going away. Um create and expand a business development program. I think that's one Josh has been wanting to try to work on. Study elimination of the business tax equipment tax. So if this is, it'll probably never happen in my lifetime, but it's always comes up when you talk to businesses. We are one of the few communities that taxes biz building uh, business equipment. So um, in some cases that makes an impact on businesses, whether they locate to us, locate in Montpelier or not. Um, just like you have property tax, in this case, the businesses come through and they would have to also pay for a tax on their desks and their computers and photocopiers and things like that. So sometimes a business that has a lot of equipment might decide that they don't want to pay all that extra tax and simply locate in a different community that doesn't have that tax, which is just about every other community. Um do you think we should move to public? I'm just aware of the time and knowing ah, that we're going to end yes. at 7.30. A week Very if, good point. If um, we did like we want to have a quick conversation if somebody had a question on economic development or jump to public safety? I have a few very brief comments on okay. economic development. Uh, it's been suggested by tourists and locals that we use infrastructure that already exists here to have abundant Wi-Fi. We've got the, we own the transit center. We could generate, we could broadcast Wi Fi. It's good right now in front of City Hall. It took a year for me to convince somebody to plug back in the Wi Fi that was unplugged during the flood, you know? Uh, more resilient telecom will overlap with public safety. I'll raise that there. Um, and at the lowest level, opportunities for the unhoused to earn some casual day labor and even a redemption center. The city tore down the redemption center with no backup plan and therefore forced all of the merchants to legally be required to take back the empties. None of them do nor want to. Shaw's doesn't even maintain their machines. So at the basic level of the people who are sleeping outside, we should facilitate or encourage or support a business to create a redemption center. Uh, it, it helps solve the litter problem and it gives a little bit of motivation, but uh, we could work with the merchants to create a casual to vet people and create, here's a $50 task, here's a $100 task and give these 
folks some opportunity that they otherwise don't have. And we just by formalizing a little bit, I know that's not economic development in the scale you're talking about, but it means the world to the folks that are uh, doing it out right now. So I'm speaking on behalf of people who come directly to me and said, get us a place to return our bottle, you know? So that's, that's my brief piece on economic development. All right. So I'll go quickly through the public safety here again. It's all the same introduction, planning, contact, synergies, summary, who's involved. Um, Should I turn off the light again? Yeah, we can turn that off. What makes this one a little bit different is, and it was noted that um, unlike the other plans, this is really um, kind of more department plans. Um, so what you find are four plans. There's originally five. We're peeling one out. So you'll see in here discussion of emergency management that's been plucked out and is going into resilience because again, as I said, we didn't have resilience as a chapter. We've added it in. Um, and so I think just to help narrow this chapter, cause it gets a little long. Um, we, we plucked out emergency management, put that into resilience. So what we're really looking at here are the, the different departments and what are the different department plans um, and goals that each of these have. And our public safety is police, fire and EMS, dispatch, and then we have the community justice center. So that's why the chapter is public safety and community justice. And community justice is in two places. So if you know the community justice center, the CJC, they are in here, but they are also in community services. Uh, they wanted to make sure they were recognized by the fact that they're not just a part of, they're not a part of the police department. They are here to support um, folks that um, have been in that process, whether you've been a victim or whether you've been someone who was an offender, they are involved in that, but they're also involved in other things. And that's why you'll see the CJC in two places. Um, so these are more kind of agency plans. Um, so fire and emergency management and police and the community justice center. So those, they're, they're all three are located in kind of the same place. One's obviously fire, police, EMS, uh, and community justice. They're all kind of in the same area downtown. And the dispatch is in the police station. And I got something to say about dispatch when you're ready. And emergency management. We do talk about emergency management here, but again, it'll be really talked about more in the other locations. So synergy with other plans. Again, um, public safety is related to a number of other plans. In this case, we've linked them to natural resources, housing, economic development, and community services. And so uh, the implementation summary, so we've got a community justice aspiration. Mount Pedro will be a safe and healthy, safe and healthier community by helping people whose lives have been disrupted by conflict or crime, by implementing victim-centered restorative justice processes, and by helping people return to the community from incarceration successfully, uh, from incarceration successfully integrate into the community. And the police aspiration, which gets to be a little, a little longer. Uh, Montpelier will have a safe community that is achieved through publicly trusted police department where officer wellness is safeguarded. This will be accomplished by the nationally recommended and accepted six pillars of 21st century policing, which is building trust and legitimacy, establishing policy in line with community values, utilizing technology, work with local residents through community policing and have a well-trained and educated workforce and ensure the safety and wellness of its officers. So those are the six pillars of 21st century policing that our city has adopted. And dispatch will provide superior public safety communication services through an appropriate amount of certified staff with adequate facilities and operating on a reliable and redundant system. So again, this is the aspiration. This is what we aspire to have. Fire and EMS, uh, Montpelier will save lives and protect property through excellence in emergency response and prevention of fire. 
and uh, emergency management aspiration. The city will city of Montpelier again. This will get plucked out, plucked in, plunked into the other one. Uh, reduce long term risk to people and property from natural man made hazards and man made hazards. This will be accomplished through a well prepared emergency response to any disaster, followed by an efficient and effective recovery in order to build back better. In the times between disasters, the city will reduce or eliminate the potential impacts of hazards through long term mitigation efforts. So we're going to have a more detailed plan of that. We're going to have an entire chapter just on basically that. And then the strategies, we really kind of break this into police, EMS, dispatch, emergency management, community justice. Um, who's involved? Obviously, those are the various players. Um, and we've got the survey at the end. And really quick, this is one of them. This happens to be dispatch was the first one I, I happened to grab up here. So all of these, um, and we won't have time because we're running a little short on time to go through all of them, but all of them have the same thing. We've got our, our aspiration and we've got obviously this. So we talked about providing superior public safety communications through an appropriate amount of certified staff with adequate facilities operating on a reliable and redundant system. So that would mean for MPD dispatch to continue to improve its quality of communication service, to expand the police station, to allow for additional space to expand the dispatch center and to improve reliability of the dispatching system through redundancy with Barry uh, city and the Vermont state police. So, and then there's a set of strategies um, continuing their dispatch services, complete the Televate study, uh, get APCO accreditation, although I, I think I've got to double check. I think they had stopped wanting to do that accreditation, but I didn't want to take the policy out without checking with them. Um, and create and implement uh, staffing policy that has to do with the number of staff that they have. Uh, implement uh, dispatch certification policy. They wanted to expand, again, do something new, uh, to add emergency medical dispatch certification. So that would allow them to do a, a different additional work. So by doing additional work, they might be able to take on additional contracts. So again, this all breaks down for dispatch. But again, I can go through each one of those other pages as well. That was public safety. Can you continue this dispatch to another day if you're running short on time? Because that's a big topic that I've spent years working on. We uh, There'll be a... a Second public hearing, and I'm just trying to quickly jump through. We also have. Yeah, we're just skimming this. I, I I really don't understand if this is a time for the planning commission to learn what Mike's put in the plan, or whether it's a time to, you know, help you understand the issues and decide whether to change what's in the plan. So, well, these are all. Uh, to be clear, we put. We put these together. Staff put these together. These have already been to the Planning Commission. And we've then taken what we heard from the Planning Commission to put them into this document in this way. So the Planning Commission, we've got some new members who haven't seen this, but folks who have been here have reviewed this. This The, the language you see here is the language that was approved by the Planning Commission. So, um, that's what's in, in the plan at this point. So we're... Um, it really, this is going to be for for the public, and I guess we can, Should if we, we want to, take we could take some time. Yeah, I don't know. Is anyone? If I, uh, we've still got. On the... We still have a, a Catherine here who. Uh, Just, if there's anyone on Zoom who wants to make a comment, if, if you want to. Aaron's one of your members, right? Yes, Aaron is one of our our members who came in later so um or we can start taking some comments from um but if for people there as we said that was just one we went through really quickly to show you what was the dispatch there's also a similar page uh, implementation plan for fire ems police and the community justice center so i know the most about dispatch <laughs> not the others so i'll i would encourage you to hear me out on this one because you know so my, 
Montpelier's dispatch is not sustainable. It it's a million dollar a year operation. Uh, it. It brings in about 400, 450,000 a year in revenue, but it's had an operations committee according, it's it's a combination of the Montpelier Police Department and a countywide mutual aid group of firemen. And they wrote an agreement 20 years ago and it keeps getting renewed. And it has an operating committee that's supposed to uh, oversee the infrastructure and the policies and the and the failures. I mean, a dispatch error, we killed a man on Spring Street Bridge because of a dispatch error that they still refuse to own up to, right? But this committee that I that's created in the agreement has not met in 20 years. Okay. There are no minutes, no agendas of this committee. So Montpelier needs to be out of the dispatch business. It needs to be regionalized and it needs to be paired with another regional dispatch situation that can fail over, both having the capacity to handle their own and in a failover situation, the others simultaneously. And there was a regional dispatch work group that worked with Paul White, first selectman in Barrytown uh, two years ago that produced a report. The legislature last year created the Public Safety Communications Task Force. They've hired an $800,000 consultant. All these, they're meeting every other week or sometimes every week. This is a huge issue and it's not sustainable. It's 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 folly to think that Barry and Montpelier, Barry, which has two dispatchers in, a, in their fire station could handle their own traffic which is more than Montpelier's, and 20 some odd towns that Montpelier dispatches for simultaneously as failover. So there is no failover right now. We don't have redundant radio systems. We we don't have any governance or oversight. It's basically a income producing enterprise that Frazier conspired with one of our city councilors to put on the ballot and get voted on dissolution of a central Vermont public safety authority, which we had worked six years to create. It was a charter. The thing had bonding authority, but the city wouldn't buy into it because of our little monopoly enterprise here. So this is a big issue and it probably should be fleshed out in the context of our plan. And there are other people you can hear from. Kim Cheney, former attorney general. He was chair of the CVPSA board. Paco Almont, former Deputy Commissioner of Public Safety, who was paid staff on the authority. And the front level of frustration and lack of planning and lack of buy-in. And our former police chief was in charge of getting new member towns to join. It, it ended up with only Barry and Montpelier as members, and therefore it couldn't get off the ground. It couldn't launch. And the guy in charge of getting new members was Doug Hoyt. And he did nothing. He admitted on the record, I did nothing to get any other towns to join. So we don't need, we need to look live within our budget. We need to help create a regional dispatch and get Montpelier out of that business. If these people can transfer, there's some good people here. The technology needs to be replaced. Uh, it needs to be designed in failover with another regional dispatch. St. Jay might be a good prospect. Uh, that's the short version. You could you could hear you could learn an hour about this from Paco Kim, you know. Uh, but even Brian P. in his short tenure here said dispatch should be regionalized. It makes no sense to have this as a profit center distracting from our resources and budget in, in our own police department. Uh, a region-wide, region-owned radio system and dispatch, part of the problem became unions, the union in Barrie and the union in Montpelier that, that protects the two dispatcher staffs weren't meshing, uh, the benefits, et cetera. But it, it does make sense to create a regional one and then uh, see the control of that. And these people are skilled, they can go there and work 
and then ideally be cross-trained to also take an empty seat if our center got wiped out COVID or a explosion or something, they could instantly go sit in St. Johnsbury and be productive because the screens are designed with the same way with the same member departments. So that's a great exercise for a plan to flesh out. And you've got good health. Paco is now a selectman in Stowe, which is in our Senate district. And he's still, uh, he's both, uh, I think, optimistic and uh, maybe a little bitter from what happened here. But uh, I think I would encourage you to learn about that and impress upon the council that our selfish uh, profit center, you know, maybe that motivation to keep it, but we, to have extinguished a, re, a regional authority that was up and running, one of the only two in the state, uh, is regrettable, unconscionable, I would say. But if Fraser's contract isn't renewed next year, next March is the time we have to, then it might become easier to launch that. He has to get notice this March for that we're not going to renew it the following March. And our mayor refuses to discuss it. Thanks. That, no. Okay. But having devoted years of working in all these meetings and transcribing all the testimony and te have devoted years to that and then watch, you know, those few autocratic moves to lay all that to waste, you know. Kim Cheney, do you, any of you know him? He's he's local. Again, former state attorney general, brilliant lawyer, old now. And uh, there's a lot of written history on this, if you want to know. But I encourage you to focus on the dispatch piece because it's an area where you could set a direction, even if it's going to take us three years to relaunch a regional authority. We need to voice that direction, not just assume that whatever the police or the dispatch shop said they wanted, we're going to do. Thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Any other thoughts, questions from the board? Well, no. We were about to say that there was going to be a second hearing for these yes. same three. When is, when is that one scheduled? We've been we've had terrible luck of landing hours on um, holidays or... on holidays. So oh, was I it believe... Veterans Day? I believe we land on Veterans Day next. So, yeah, that's, yeah, sometimes Veterans Day is always the 11th, so sometimes it's a different day of the week, but this time it's Monday. So um, I know everybody said they had problems on the 12th or the Tuesdays. So if we waited, if we just skip next meeting and we'll have this conversation as to what we want to do that puts us on the 25th which oh by the way it's the same week as thanksgiving but it is monday so it's not like wednesday so we could meet the 25th how about like the 13th or what are what are people's availability on um, on the 12th or the or the 13th um my tuesday conflict is has ended now Yeah, I'm available on the 12th. I'm also available on the 12th. Me too. Yeah, the 13th would be difficult because this room on the 13th will be the city council. So, and I have I, a conflict on I the 13th. Oh. But the 12th, the 12th. But if the 12th works, I will, I'll have to confirm and then I'll get back to you because I have to go and make sure somebody else doesn't have this room on the 12th. So, um, it would probably be the 12th at 5.30 if that works out. Great. Is there still the option of having these meetings at the senior center or other locations? Yes, we could could do it. It just takes a little more logistically. It can be a little bit more challenging to get some of those to work. Um, and the Wi-Fi breaks there, which knocks the whole Zoom session out. Uh, again, that, if we strike to the Wi-Fi... <laughs> I, I think this is a better format. I, I think when we try to do those poster boards, it's really hard to, yeah. I think it'll 
it'll be easier when you do the public hearings with the poster boards when we get to that step when we've got a lot to talk about because we're not gonna be able to go through it in this right. detail when we have our public hearings, we're gonna have 12 of them, all 12 poster boards so we're gonna really have you know multiple opportunities but also a lot so we'll want a space it might not it might not have an online we might have to have one virtual and then one in person that we could do at a place like you know like the senior center where we can put out lots we need space because you got to put out 12 of those boards and talk to people and answer questions and see what people want to do um because so the public hearing process is going to be a lot more um congested well will we put those like put the boards out in the hall maybe so that people can go look you know because you know, we have been out here in the hall earlier yeah that's so, you know one of the like you were saying you know we've all looked at these we've had access to them since you know whenever I think they, you should put out a, a but, narrative version that people can spend time with it without having to go and collect 12 or 20 different pieces right there yeah the, a document that people there's, can familiarize themselves with yeah so some of the document the that has the aspirations and goals to have those posters and maybe just here in the hall even that people can come and look at them uh so that you know when we actually do have the public uh meeting that you know people already have seen it and we're not spending the entire time having people get to know it and yeah we, we've been library's going... willing to host them too does they if they fix their elevator <laughs> and the pdfs i mean i don't i don't know i mean they're uh i mean it's easy to print out have all that stuff and you know people have asked for written yeah we can know, print out 11 right? by 17s and yeah. the issue that's been coming up is we've been working we received a lot of comment and you know sometimes people are like well where's this well we received a lot of comment and we made a lot of changes and so i've been working with evelyn to go through and get those changes integrate them into these things and proofread them again get them back to her and we're getting you know we've got eight final Eight of these are now final, or um, and so we've got a, a starting to get a good stack of them that we could print out, but we really haven't had the ability to print out new posters yet. So that's why we've been liking to use the online because it costs money to print those out. So once we've got something that we think are close to final, we can print out another copy, get it on the storyboards, put it out for public input. I'd like to get as many of them out as we can um, for election day, because people are going to be wandering through, give people an opportunity to kind of see what we're doing. Um, and then, um, the, the, the online version there, the, it was intended to have the PDF and sharing the screen right now, but the, there was, um, we were supposed to have this set up as the new web and we've had some issues with the web getting it reformatted but the intention is to have that symbol like you saw like the bell for the historic resources to then have the link to that storyboard to have a pdf of that storyboard obviously it won't have the maps but it would have a pdf of the word text of what's in there so if somebody wanted to print it out they could print it out because it's pdf then we would have the implementation plan as well which people could print out so that was that was the idea of where we wanted to try to get this. But at a certain point, we're shuffling all this to the new website, which is being built. So as soon as we're kind of thinking, maybe we'll just wait. When we get the last three done, then we can start migrating the whole thing over to get the new to the new website where people would have a much more interactive experience being able to move from this document to that document back to this document over to there because it's all in a single Board. But by doing so, you're leaving behind a whole population of people that aren't facile in this environment, and and we need to not leave them behind. It we need them engaged in their thoughts and what what's getting dropped here. So, I would ask you to give some real thought to making this experimental storyboard web based plan for the annual updates, but commit to paper and broad circulation of paper copies for this one because it's too important and it's going to last eight years. 
and our minds were adapted over time from chisel and stone all the way to ink on paper and we retain things differently we learn differently than we do with disappearing pixels so it, you, you start to just scroll and you don't absorb what it is you're and these are big issues you're all wrestling with thanks for hearing me out so did you want to jump on the last minutes? Yeah. Um, yeah. Would somebody, I don't know if people have had a chance to look at the minutes of July 22nd and September 9th, but if we all want to take a minute to look at them and if anyone wants to move approval. I'll move to approve them once everybody, I've looked through it, but once everybody, once everybody's had a minute. Okay. Both. Both July 22nd yes. and September 9th grade. Motion by Sean. I'm making an assumption here because I was not ready for the I do not need to voice an opinion on this. <laughs> yeah. Votes, right? To pass the minutes without. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Plenty. Four, four people. We just need a second, whatever Maybe Marie is reviewing. I'll second that motion. Oh, Aaron. Sorry. Forgot about you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm forgettable, especially when I'm just a black spot on the screen. <laughs> yes, you're on the screen. <laughs> um, all right. All those. In, or do, do you want some more time, Maria? It looks like you're still reading. Sorry, guys. So while no, no okay. while while she's reading, it was just as as an update for people wondering why there aren't minutes for I want to say the September twenty something. We had another meeting. We didn't have a quorum. That's why there's no minutes for that meeting. Is that the meeting where you talked about the bike path? That's the meeting we talked about the bike path. We didn't have a quorum. Is it recorded? Uh yes. It, Orca has a recording of that. I'm I'm good on Ryan with the the minutes. Okay. okay. I'm good too. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Aye. That's great. Um okay, so it sounds like we have a plan for November twelfth as our next meeting. And I will let everybody know as soon as I have confirmed that. Right. So oh, okay. Can, right. Make sure you can right. get it on your calendar. Yes. You have to confirm the space. Um, yep. If anyone wants to make a move to adjourn. So moved. On. Yeah. Okay. Great. All okay. those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everybody.